Hi, I'm Bill Lancaster, and I'll be your host for this video session on turning free wood. If you're going to be a, a wood turner, especially if you're going to be a bowl turner, you just got to practice and do a lot of bowls. Just practice, practice, practice. And um, to do that, you need some source of free wood. And you need to know how to treat that free wood and get it uh, onto the lathe properly and, and safely and without uh, the wood cracking. So we're going to have a session here today on, on turning free wood. In South Carolina, we have a lot of trees, a lot of uh, free wood, and so you just about can't have any piece of ground without trees growing on it. Uh, it takes 20 years to develop a piece of ground from raw field to a hardwood, and first you get pines, and then you get the, uh, the hardwoods growing up among the pines. Finally, you get some nice, uh, nice hardwoods, and then another 20 years after that, you've got some big trees, and we have a lot of land around here and a lot of trees, and I'm fortunate to have a good friend who's got a lot of land. He likes to farm, he likes to deer hunt, and he has given me a lot of free wood, including walnut and cherry and some really nice wood. So I'm appreciative of him very much for doing this. I began to turn a lot of free wood in the beginning, and I had done some wood turning younger when my dad i would watch my dad do it he, we had a shopsmith uh, one of the old old shopsmiths that was before the mark V, and uh, he had a lathe that he would use and do some wood turning on it and i watched and learned a few things i didn't know how much i didn't know until i had a class at the woodworkers guild and i learned how much i didn't know about lathe and wood turning and i never even sharpened tools until then i just used the tools over and over again so a lot of things can can happen if you uh, if you take some classes and learn how to do it. Go to a, one of the wood stores or woodworking stores, or take it if you're in a um, a, a guild or a, if you're a member of a, of a club that does it. That's where you're going to learn a whole lot. So uh, do that, and then you can start with uh, with wood that's just uh, uh, cut down in the yard. I, uh, I started out doing some, some uh, cedar that was just a power line right away. I mean, you can do a lot of things with just free wood. So you need to have free wood. Um, in the beginning, after I had that class in, in March, I began to just turn wood and turn bowls. And I liked doing bowls. I kind of got hooked on the lathe and hooked on bowls. And I was going to give them out to Christmas. Uh, and by the time Christmas came around, my wife said, Bill, I've wrapped 52 bowls <laughs> for Christmas presents, so I didn't really know how many I had done, but I just kept doing them and sticking them in a box and setting them aside and doing another one. And so I had a lot of uh, free wood, and that's what you got to have to begin with. Um, to start with, you're going to have a half log. Let me show you what you start with. This is a half log. Of course, it be you begin with really a full log, but. Uh, this is a, a half. You can cut these things down the middle with a chainsaw, or if you're kind of daring, you can use a big bandsaw. You've, if you use a bandsaw, you've got to stabilize this thing so it doesn't rock on you on the saw. You've got to have it in a log mill or something to keep it stabilized. And then once you, once you um, uh, have the, 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 the wood cut down, you have to coat the ends of it with either uh, anchor seal, which is a kind of a waxy stuff, or a latex paint. I asked a friend uh, how, how, how quickly you should coat the ends. He said, as the tree is falling. So he was facetious, of course, but he meant you just do it as quickly as you can. So as soon as the wood is cut, coat the ends. The uh, grain is like straws that go this way. So you just have to coat the ends. You don't have to worry about the, uh, the side there. It's not going to dry out on you, but the ends will. So coat them. With either anchor seal or with um, with uh, uh, latex paint. If you uh, get to this point, what you need to do is you got to get this thing into some sort of a shape so you can put it on the lathe and make it somewhat round. So you make yourself a set of discs. I've got a whole set of these discs like this. Just cut out a poster paper. So this one is about the right diameter for it. You can check the uh, diameter on the end or on the flat side. Be sure, though, when you put this thing on the bandsaw to cut it, you put it on this side. 
on the bark side, keep the flat side on the table of the bandsaw so it will not rock on you. We've had some, some crazy folks doing it the other way, putting the, the disc on that side and having this rock on them. I tell you what, you will break and bend a bandsaw blade in a no time flat and you get hurt. So just put this on your, uh, on your bark side, put a nail down through it to hold it, and then cut around the outside of that perimeter to make yourself a, uh, a, uh, a round bow blank. If you don't want to cut it like that, you can do it, you can cut straight cuts along the sides like this with a, with a chainsaw or with a bandsaw. I like to use a big bandsaw we have at the uh, gill to cut these straight, just straight lines. It doesn't matter if it's not uh, round in the beginning, you're going to make it round on the lathe. So make yourself a cut, set of these discs. This is a nine inch. Uh, I'd go from six up to about 12 and get yourself um, a set so you can then cut these uh, half logs into bow blanks. After you do that, you'll have something like this. I'll show you. Here's a piece that I have uh, cut. You see, I've just done straight cuts along the sides. It doesn't have to be round. I've taken the bark off this thing because uh, I didn't really want the bark and it's going to go eventually. You've got to have a good solid surface here to, to mount it on the lathe. And so you need to take the bark all the way off or you can drill down through the bark with a Forstner bit uh, and or a Take a chainsaw and go this way. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Al Sturt does that. Uh, you take a chisel, get down to good wood so you can have a solid mounting service when you do mount this thing on the lathe. There are various ways of mounting these things. I'm going to show you some right now. Um, the, you can mount it between center, so put a, a spur drive in one end, and this is a, a live center. Last one on the other end, you can just put it between centers and uh, make sure you've, when you have this disc, mark the center point with a nail or something down through it so you know where the centers are on both sides. That'll get you approximately right. And then you can mount it between centers like this. I like to mount them between centers and then cut a tenon on both sides. That's my, my technique. So that's one way to do it. Another way, and this is probably the most common way is to use a face plate. This is a little aluminum face plate. Uh, this is not too big. It's just kind of a small one, but um, it's got a lot of screw holes in it. So this fits the spindle right there. And if you use the uh, face plate, use these uh, sheet metal screws. Sheet metal screws are stronger than their regular screws. These wood screws like that can break and you don't, you do not want to break one of these screws in your wood. I will tell you, I've spent a lot of time digging broken screws out of wood, especially if you're using a hard wood like Purple Heart or something like that. It will break those screws off and, and then you have a dickens of a time digging them out. You cannot turn these things on the lathe with a screw in there because it'll hit your chisel and, and you don't want to have that making such a mess and uh, maybe injuring you. So get the screws out. But you don't break them off in the first place. Get these, these uh, sheet metal screws. They're stronger. They don't break as easily and, uh, and use them. If you wear out the, uh, the driver's side of the screw, just throw it away. Get yourself another box. Don't take a chance on, on uh, wearing out that driver's side to the point where you get that whole screw stuck in there and you can't get it out one way or the other. That's not good and uh, you'll spend a lot of time trying to get those things out. So, a faceplate. This is a faceplate ring, similar kind of device. You screw the ring onto the wood and then you, you put the, the ring, uh, the chuck into the ring. This is a Vicmark uh, dovetailed faceplate ring. It will fit the Vicmark 100 chuck. So, uh, this is a little bigger one. This goes with a Vicmark uh, 120. A bigger faceplate ring, you screw the ring onto the wood and then you can just put the, that right in the chuck and it will fit perfectly and it'll be very secure. So you can use a faceplate ring to mount your, uh, your uh, bowls with or a faceplate. Another common way is to use the uh, screw, the screw chuck. This is the screw that comes with the, with the chuck 
you've got to be sure when you do this, you use the manufacturer's own instructions for mounting this screw. Uh, with the one-way screw has a nice uh, set of grooves in the side that will fit under the jaws. That's fine. You want to use those grooves and make sure they fit them just the way the manufacturer says. This one does not have grooves, so it fits in there. You tighten up the spin true. If it's a little bit off, off uh, angled, it'll wobble. If it's not tight, it'll, it'll wobble and maybe come off. <clears throat> so with, especially with the, uh, with the uh, one way, be sure you get it mounted in there by the manufacturer's instruction, instructions and that it's very secure. You don't want this piece of wood coming loose on you. So use that. This is a, the screw takes about a three of an inch uh, hole in your wood and uh, you can strip those out if you don't watch out. So put them on there. If you can use the tail stock, fine. If not, um, it's better if you don't have to use this tail stock because you can get to the whole bottom of the bowl with a screw. So that's the screw chuck. So those are the ways you, uh, you can mount this thing. And there may be some other ways I haven't thought of to tell you about. But anyway, those are three other ways to do it. Now, when you start to turn, you can have this thing mounted kind of like this. You don't have to worry about whether it's round or not. A lot of folks like to make this side round. It doesn't matter. If you just start shaping your bowl, that's going to become round. You just make a cut across here, and as it gets to the end, it'll cut that round. So it'll save yourself a lot of beating up if you just, um, if you just uh, make that round as you go, instead of trying to make it round from the very beginning. Um, I like to put a tenon in both sides of my, my bowls when I do them. This is a tenon. I've put this between centers. I've cut a tenon on the bottom, uh, which really is the top of the bowl. And I'll mount this in the chuck and I'll cut another tenon on this side. I like having it on both sides. I feel like it just runs truer that way. This is a, a kill dried maple uh, bowl blank. This, I call them a, a pill box because I don't know what else to call it. Um, and uh, that's bought from uh, a place called Gotwood down at Donald, South Carolina. They have a lot, of, a lot of types of wood there for sale. And so I like to put those two tenons on mine. Um, so when you, uh, when, you, when you do this, you just kind of nibble off the sides of the, of, the, uh, of the wood as you turn and make it, start making it into a bowl shape. The bottom is already bowl shaped like this, you know, so that's a good thing. People ask, why do you do the, the, do the, with the grain this way? You have to get rid of the pith. And you see that's, the pith is just, just off the uh, wood there, you got to get rid of that pith. And uh, that pith will crack almost every time. You just don't want to have that pith in there. So the grain goes this way across the bowl, not, not up and down the log as you might think. You can turn it the other way, and I'll show you one. Here's one. You see the barks all around the top. Uh, I've turned it um, longitudinally. It's very difficult. It's uh, all in grain. I had to use the John Jordan uh, hollowing system to get that thing turned out. It's very difficult. But you still have the pith in the bottom to worry about. If the pith cracks, it'll crack the whole thing. So what I do? I took the pith out. Took the whole bottom out. So I had to come back and finish that and put a new, uh, new bottom in it. When this thing finishes moving, it has not cracked on me. The, the, even the pith didn't crack very much, but it cracked a little bit. So I'll put a new bottom either out of a different kind of wood or a similar wood or epoxy to uh, make that thing whole. So that's, you have to do something with the pith. And don't want to leave the pith in your wood. It will crack. If it does crack, you can fill it sometimes with epoxy uh, and keep going with it or it may just crack your whole bowl to the point where you can't do anything. If you turn green wood, and most of us do that when we get free wood, it's going to do two things. It's going to warp on you. It may split on you. So you've got to learn how to deal with green wood. 
and there are other videos on the on the uh, on YouTube that will teach you how to deal with green wood. You've got to learn how to deal with green wood and the different methods of doing that, but get one that uh, works for you. And you can de kind of develop a pipeline of, uh, of wood to be turned. Sometimes it takes six months to dry out a good chunk of wood. So um, you need to, need to have a kind of pipeline of wood coming to you. When I started, I, uh, uh, my dad had a shopsmith, and he did some lathe work on it. I watched him. I learned a few things. So after he died, I got the shopsmith, and I did a lot of, uh, I did not a lot of turning. I did some turning. I was pretty good at it. I never sharpened a tool. I just always used them the way they were. And uh, But when I had a, a class at the guild, uh, one spring, I got turned on to the lathe and just loved it and started turning wood turning bowls. I like bowls. <clears throat> so from March when I had the class until Christmas, I just turned bowls one to another and had a lot of free wood. Um, I had a cousin who had a, uh, lives on a property that was bought by my great grandparents in 1881. And so a power line crew came through there and cut out some cedars. And so uh, I went over there and she let me have the wood, another cousin had gotten most of the big stuff. I got little pieces of cedar and made little bowls like this for all my cousins who were connected to that piece of land. This has some worm worm holes in it. My wife liked this one, and so I gave it to her. This was done in 2015. It's a little cedar bowl and has just a plain flat bottom. <clears throat> it's not very fancy at all, but one of the first ones I did, the, the bottom, the sides are not really sophisticated. They get a little thicker as you go to the bottom. So, but that's what you can do. That's free wood, and people like little bowls. We all want to seem to want to turn these great big bowls. We get these big chunks of tree. Well, you, if every house has one big bowl, that's all they need. You don't need a lot of big bowls. So, but these little bowls are very handy. So, to get used to liking little bowls. Um, another bowl I turned early on was this hickory. This has a natural edge on it. It's wonderful thing to do with natural edge. This has a great color to it and it's very thick. You can see how the walls are very thick so it's not real uh, professional. It goes straight down to the bottom and turns right angle. I wouldn't do that today probably but that was that thin. Um, more recently I've done this nice piece of walnut. It's a great piece. I learned how to do some grain balancing and you see this light grain at the bottom. It's all grain balanced so that I've got uh, both uh, the light wood and the dark wood on this walnut, both showing. It makes a kind of a nice uh, contrast. I got into doing painting. So um, this is a, a piece of ash. And I got into doing milk paint painting. So with this kind of grain, a different color. And I just really like doing this. I like this kind of... Uh, rim on the bowl. Ashley Harwood showed me how to do that rim and it's, a, it's an interesting little design. She will put a, a bead around hers often and along with that rim, but this is very light, thin. Now that I've kind of learned, I try to make my bowls no, long, no thinner than 3 16th of an inch. I don't want them to be fragile. I don't want them to break when they're dropped. So I like bowls that are both practical and beautiful. I hope they do both things. So <clears throat> I just try to make these things not too thin. I want them thin enough so that they, they are lightweight and they feel good, and, um, but not too thin. I don't want them to be fragile. So that's about 3 sixteenths of an inch, and you can develop your own uh, style of doing things. Here's another fairly recent bowl. This one's got a prominent bead around the top. It's a fairly shallow bowl. This is uh, ambrosia maple. Turned within this year. It's got the same kind of rim on it that, that Ashley uses. And I've got kind of developed two rims that I like. This is one of them. That's a kind of a typical Ashley Harwood style. So um, those are some things you can do. Um, let me just check my notes here to make sure I'm not. Oh, when you first mount one of these chunks of wood on the lathe, you have to watch your lathe speed. This will not be balanced, so it's going to want to vibrate the lathe. And so you have to uh, t 
turn this thing fairly slowly. You want to, you can turn the speed up when you feel the lathe start to shake, turn the speed down until it doesn't shake anymore. That'll be about the right speed. That may be just 400 RPM, maybe 500 if you're lucky. It's going to be pretty darn slow for the lathe. So just get used to turning them slow at the beginning until you get them balanced. I had a friend who had a big chunk of wood on the lathe, and so in fact, it's on this lathe. And um, he was turning it, the lathe was hopping along, he walked across the floor. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, it's a, it's a heavy lathe that can do this. I said, no, it can't. It can't take that piece of wood unbalanced the way it is. So you just have to, uh, have to slow it down and take your time with it, be patient, and it will, uh, you'll make it round. And then you can turn the speed up. So make sure you get the speed correct before you, uh, and always, always turn the speed down to zero before you pull it on switch. If you have it at a high speed and this thing starts hopping around on you, you're gonna have a problem. So just get the thing slowed down. Um, I like to use the 4040 gouge on the outside and the uh, David Ellsworth uh, signature gouge on the inside, just my preference, but I've been doing this since about 2015 and I've developed some, uh, uh, some, some favorite ways of doing it. If you can go to a, a symposium, a woodturner symposium, the American Association of Woodturners has one every year, an annual meeting. They have wonderful demonstrators. You might have a state uh, uh, symposium to go to. You might have a local uh, woodworkers guild or a club that does this sort of thing. Go there, you will learn so much and your, your skill level will rise exponentially if you can learn from those who've already done it. So I'm fortunate to have a lot of folks who've done it, done it better than I do it, and uh, I've learned from every one of them. So uh, uh, the, the Carolina Mountain Woodturners is, is a great um, place for me to go. It's close by. I'm a member there, and if you go to one of these places, you'll have a lot of others who've done it, and they're experts. So that's kind of the way you get started with free wood. Just get it. It's going to be wet. Learn how to deal with wet wood. Get, develop yourself a pipeline of wood to, uh, um, to, to turn on the lathe. And, um, and learn how to do some finishing too. So uh, I hope that's helpful to you. Be sure to, uh, to watch other videos that will show you more about how to deal with wet wood, how to deal with natural edge and various things. And that's all for me for today. So hope you've gotten a lot out of this and we'll see you next time.